Yeah, so I guess if you if you have a question, then just shout as loud as you can. But there's also this mic. So if you wave at me, I'll I'll run the mic over to you. Uh, if you don't feel comfortable shouting. Seems like a good compromise. Okay, let's let's just get uh, started. I think I think it's uh, time. Okay, so we're really, really delighted to have Luca Trevisan delivering some lectures in our boot camp where I personally am extremely sad that he couldn't be here uh, in real life, but we'll take what we can get. And so, uh, Luca, I'm handing it off to you. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. So the, the lectures that I've prepared for, uh, for these four hours are on a computational complexity theory of um, average case complexity of um, algorithms. And the set of topics that I hope to cover are to, well, I guess very briefly discuss what it even means exactly to talk about the average case complexity of problems. So what is a distribution problem and uh, what are various not entirely equivalent notions of uh, what it means for an algorithm to be average case efficient. Uh, then we will see how the standard tools of computational complexity have been uh, brought to bear on the study of the average case complexity of problems. Uh, so then those tools are uh, reductions and uh, completeness. Like, is it possible to show that at least if uh, some problem is hard on average, then some other problem also is, and then construct a chain of reductions as we have done for the study of uh, NP-completeness or uh, uh, hardness of approximation. Uh, so here the definitions of exactly kind of how reductions work are also a little bit subtle because you kind of want to make sure that even an algorithm that makes mistakes or runs in very long time on some small probability set can be used to um, solve some um, uh, different problem. Uh, so then we will see actually the existence of uh, complete problems in the sense that uh, there are very specific problems that under the uniform distribution, if you can solve them efficiently under any of the notions that we will uh, talk about, then pretty much everything can be done. Like every filter system can be broken. Every, um, every problem in NP under any reasonable distribution can be solved efficiently and so on. Uh, and then discuss some uh, final points where I think uh, like even the, if the results are a bit technical and uh, sort of narrow, the techniques by which they're proved are uh, kind of interesting. And so we will see that in uh, kind of arguing about these completeness results, an important role is played by data compression. Uh, they sort of to reduce one problem under a genetic distribution to some other problem under the uniform distribution. One thing that you want to do is to compress the input. Uh, because kind of data compression will take you from a genetic distribution to an almost uniform uh, uh, distribution. And that when you want to do that with distributions for which you don't know how to do optimal compression, something similar can be done with um, hashing. Now, uh, in uh, unsupervised machine learning, that is sort of completely unrelated to any of this, a, an important task is feature discovery for uh, so data that comes from certain distributions. And it seems that somehow it's well understood that uh, feature discovery and uh, unsupervised machine learning is closely related to compression. And that's sort of when you really don't know what to do, looking at random features can be helpful. Uh, so random features can correspond to hashing. And I think there is more than a superficial uh, connection there between kind of what is done to do reductions between problems and uh, or what is done to analyze data coming from uh, certain distributions. And so kind of even though it, it's a bit difficult to have a, a dialogue at, uh, at this distance, maybe when we get to that point, I hope there will be questions and um, uh, discussion. Uh, and then, so finally, um, so talk about why many of the things one actually would like to prove that would like to uh, kind of 
lecture on in a, in a course like this are uh, all open problems. And what there seems to be some really significant bottleneck in uh, applying this framework of reductions and completeness to the study of uh, average case problems. That somehow, when we study MP completeness or uh, hardness of approximation, basically, ultimately, all the problems are um, equivalent. Like all MP complete problems are uh, equivalent, uh, all so approximating, uh, I don't know. Max 3 sub better than 7, 8 is equivalent to uh, approximating max click better than n to the 0.99 because of one problem with the other. But when it comes to average case complexity, it seems like uh, different problems are hard for different reasons. And so that it isn't really possible to interreduce them one to the other. Okay, so uh, most of what I will uh, talk about today will be the definition of efficiency for, uh, uh, for average case complexity, notions of reductions between problems, and uh, uh, how to get completeness results. And the reference for um, all of this, it's a paper by Levin that appeared in uh, Stock 1984, which is shown here. And what I'm showing is not the first page of the paper, but uh, it's the paper. <laughs> like the, uh, this was a one page paper with no references, which contains stuff that sort of took the community a lot of time and uh, a lot of uh, 50 page long papers to kind of digest and uh, uh, reconstruct. Uh, so then later, Levin published a full version of this paper in Cyclone, which was two pages long. And uh, according to legend, I don't know if the story is true, but it's uh, good enough, even if it's false. Uh, the editor said, well, this paper is great, we ought to accept it, but it should be at least uh, four times longer. And then Levin sent back a revision, which was four copies of uh, the same paper stapled together. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so, um, so, so, uh, so this is starting from the beginning. The kind of problems that we want to uh, talk about are problems that come with a distribution of inputs that for the sake of all these four hours, we will always assume it's a known distribution. So there's some problem with a, a, a known distribution. And actually, uh, kind of whenever I talk about a distribution of inputs, what I actually mean, it's a collection of distributions, one distribution for every input length, uh, whatever input length means in, uh, uh, for each particular problem. Maybe not literally the number of bits it takes to write an instance, but some size parameter that makes sense for the problem. And maybe if uh, we're talking about graphs, uh, we have one distribution for each n, and it's a distribution of a graph with n vertices. Or if you're mm, talking about uh, um, n by n by n tensors, again, it will be one distribution for every n, where n is the uh, size of each dimension. So here are some problems that uh, maybe we'd like to apply this theory to, uh, perhaps a planted click where n is the uh, number of vertices or uh, a random tree start with a certain fixed density of clauses where n might be the number of um, variables. And by the way, we'll see kind of different problems will come with somewhat different notions of what it means for an algorithm to be uh, good on average. Like say for a random tree start below the threshold, what we would like an algorithm to do is to find a satisfying assignment almost always, since we know that one exists almost always. For a random formula above the threshold, what we would like is to find some kind of certificate of unsatisfiability almost always, since we know that the formula will be unsatisfiable almost always. Yeah. Um, or maybe we have interesting problems that are more like a numerical flavor or linear algebraic or um, uh, maybe also problems in uh, cryptography. All of them come with some definition of uh, what we want to do, that's the problem, and some description of what the inputs look, look like, which is the ensemble of distributions. Okay, so let's uh, now um, discuss what it means for an algorithm to be uh, efficient since uh, it's a surprisingly a subtle issue, and there are a couple of possible definitions, 
neither of which is the first definition that would uh, come to mind. Okay, so let's say we have some problem uh, uh, P and there is some ensemble of uh, distributions, let's just call it a distribution over inputs. And uh, we have some uh, algorithm. And for now, let's think about algorithms that actually are uh, always right, but are uh, sometimes slow. Yeah. And uh, uh, let's give some name, something like T A of X. It's the uh, time of uh, A on input X. So since we are talking about average case analysis of algorithms, perhaps the uh, most natural definition is to look at what is the expectation for a random input of uh, length n of uh, the running time of the algorithm on uh, input x. And we might say that if uh, this is less than uh, some uh, polynomial in n, then the algorithm is uh, average case polynomial. So this definition uh, actually has some, uh, so has some um, uh, shortcoming. Uh, in particular, so this might seem like a really uh, weird concern, but um, uh, so bear with me. Uh, so one concern is that um, it's possible for a, an algorithm to be polynomial in expectation, even though some other algorithm that is consistently has a running time that is maybe quadratic or anyway polynomial in the previous one, it's not. So uh, imagine that we have a So imagine that A has the following uh, behavior that, um, that with probability, like maybe like there is a uniform distribution, there is one input on which the running time is very high. And then on uh, all the other inputs, uh, the running time is, I don't know, N squared. So then the expectation of the running time will be something like uh, essentially n squared. Uh, but now imagine you have some uh, other algorithm that has the running time that is quadratic Uh, in the running time of uh, A. So then now the expected running time of, uh, of this new algorithm, which is really just uh, quadratic in the running time of A, uh, this is exponential. Uh, clearly I meant, I meant it like this. All right, so why, is this a shortcoming of the definition? Uh, well, we, so first of all, um, although this seems like a really strange uh, corner case, if you're talking about algorithms that are always correct and it works on NP-complete problems, uh, we believe that there will have to be inputs on which the running time is exponential. And if it happens that the expected running time is small, that will be perhaps because these exponential in time inputs have exponentially small probability. Uh, but then it would actually be true that some uh, sufficiently large power of the running time of our algorithm will have um, exponential expectation. Uh, so in fact, this is not a corner case, but it's sort of the typical behavior of the distribution of uh, running times of uh, algorithms are always correct for uh, NP-complete problems. 
you know, since we're going to talk about sort of reductions from one point to another that might change the input length, uh, might require the simulation of some of the algorithm with some kind of slowdown. Um, it's, sort of, it's not out of the question that we might uh, end up with issues where um, we have some algorithm that really believe or sort of we want to think of as being uh, efficient. Now we do some transformation. We get a new algorithm for a new problem to a reduction. This new algorithm as a function of its running time, it's quadratically slower. Somehow quadratic in something efficient should also be efficient, but this definition doesn't um, uh, allow it. So with this uh, kind of uh, concern uh, in mind, uh, this is the definition given by uh, Levin, which is a broader definition. Like it allows to be an algorithm to be called efficient, even if its expectation is not a polynomial. So the definition uh, given by Levin is that um, A is average case polynomial, or maybe he said polynomial on average. If uh, there is a constant C, uh, such that the expectation of uh, a root, a seed root of uh, the running time is linear. So let's uh, sort of, uh, This was sort of one of the things said in one line in that one page paper that was a bit uh, uh, mystifying. Actually, it was even stranger than this because instead of talking about a collection of distributions, he actually had just uh, one distribution over all inputs. You sort of first pick your input length and then pick an input of that length. So in his definition, you were just picking an input from this single distribution. Then you were looking at some root of its running time dividing it by n, uh, there is no n. So you would be dividing it by the length of x. And then you wanted this to be finite. So that, that was how he presented things. Uh, okay, so, why did, uh, so what are the advantages of um, this definition? So first of all, if, uh, uh, if we have an algorithm that satisfies the more reasonable definition, then by convexity, it also uh, satisfies Levin's definition. So we are sort of capturing all the algorithms whose expected running time is polynomial. Uh, in addition, if uh, uh, if A and B are uh, uh, two algorithms such that one is quadratic in the other, like running time of B is always the running time of A squared, and uh, a satisfies this definition. Uh, then B will also satisfy th this definition with uh, just a bigger constant. Uh, and in fact, other robustness properties will be true for uh, this definition. If you like change the size of the input by adding other things, uh, 
you're not messing up the calculation. Luca? Yeah. Uh, this is Sam from the audience. Why, why n instead of um, n squared or root n or something? Like, it seems like if you mess with the constant c, you can, the definition would be the same if you put any polynomial in n on the right-hand side. Is that right? It's right. Uh, the reason, so it just, um, um, you have to fix a convention, or you could just say there is some constant such that the whole expression is at most a polynomial. By requiring just uh, order of n on the other side, the root that you're taking, the inverse of that, you can think of the exponent of your expected polynomial. Like if uh, the expectation of your running time to the power of one over C is linear, you can think of your running time as being kind of n to the C. So somehow the constant C has this kind of meaning if you put order of n on the right. But, um, that's but probably rather, even that's probably even formalizable, right? Like with you know with probability 0.99, you have running time at most n to the c or something like that. If you throw out uh, yes. a few inputs, exactly. So uh, so now we'll get to another nice property of uh, of this uh, definition, which is that okay. So suppose now we have uh, a Levin efficient algorithm. So now, uh, as Sam was saying, we can use Markov's inequality and then say that the probability that the running time is bigger than some uh, value Or we can uh, take roots on both sides, then take uh, uh, Marcos inequality. Uh, and so yeah, we get uh, something like this. So for example, the probability that the running time is bigger than, I don't know, n to the k, it's smaller than, uh, order of n over n to the k over c. So it's order of uh, one over n to the k over c minus one. So when you, whenever you're looking at an exponent bigger than uh, c, you get a small probability of uh, getting a running time bigger than n to that exponent. What sort of the tail of the running time of the algorithm at least to base a power law. Typically, things will be much sharper, like usually running times are much more concentrated, uh, but just the definition guarantees that there is this kind of uh, uh, no worse than power law tail of the running time of the algorithm. Can I, can I ask a question? If you yeah, can. sure. Uh, that definition would, in terms of expectation of the one over C of the running time, would not capture a situation where you still have exponentially large, large running time on polynomial exceptions. Yes. Yeah, so, so, in fact, there are a number of cases where we would kind of like to say that an algorithm is efficient, uh, but this definition would say that it isn't. Uh, so, for example, so basically, whenever you don't get this kind of tail, uh, so say that mm, maybe with uh, probability, maybe there is like one input, uh, the running time is uh, exponential, but like two to the n square. Then there is no way of uh, um, uh, getting this definition to be satisfied, even though we will never see this input uh, because it's so, so unlikely. Or even, um, you know, there is some negligible probability of uh, an exponential running time. This is always not allowed by the um, definition. Uh, so that's definitely, um, well, definitely. It's a, uh, you, uh, Mm, 
well, the, so the definition says that the uh, algorithms with this kind of behavior are never efficient. Uh, in some cases, we would like to uh, think of them as being efficient. So that's a limitation of the definition that doesn't uh, capture cases like this. Uh, however, an advantage of the uh, definition is that it has a very clean characterization. And uh, uh, the characterization is the, is the following. Uh, maybe let's uh, first look at it from uh, one direction. Uh, those things, uh, probably Levin thought they were all obvious, but they were uh, pointed out by Russell in Pagliazzo uh, that uh, sort of wrote a paper that will refer to uh, also later that had sort of lots of interesting things to say about average case complexity. So the, the characterization is the following. So here now we're thinking about uh, algorithms that are always right but sometimes they take a very long time. Uh, now, something that is done, uh, 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 sort of we do have algorithms like this. Maybe they do some kind of um, branch and bound or restrict or kind of guided search. And uh, there will be inputs on which they keep going and take a really, really long time to converge, even though on lots of other inputs, they are uh, more efficient. And what we do with algorithms of this type is that if they really take a really long time, we will not be able to run them to completion. So we will impose some kind of uh, timeout. And you can see the formula that I wrote here as saying what kind of uh, trade-off we can expect for a timeout. Like if we set a timeout at time n to the k, uh, we are guaranteed that the fraction of inputs that will cause a timeout or the probability measure of the inputs that will cause a timeout to arise is uh, at most this much. So in particular, we could uh, uh, say the following, like uh, a, a T, like what is a T such that the probability of uh, exceeding a running time of t is uh, less than epsilon. But we can kind of uh, uh, plug it in. We want uh, epsilon to be order of n divided by n to the k over c. So, sorry. But if t to the one over C. So basically T needs to be N over epsilon to the C. So this needs to be polynomial in um, N over epsilon. So if, uh, so if an algorithm is is efficient in Levin's definition, great algorithm A. Then it can be modified into uh, an algorithm A prime that takes uh, two inputs, uh, an input X and an input uh, epsilon. Uh, such that this algorithm either uh, outputs uh, the correct answer or uh, times out. And the probability that Uh, it doesn't output the uh, correct answer is less than epsilon. And the uh, running time is polynomial in uh, n over epsilon, uh, where n is the 
SASO the input. So an algorithm that is so efficient according to Levin can be transformed into an algorithm that has always polynomial running time, polynomial in the input and in some kind of uh, uh, accuracy parameter. And uh, the probability according to a distribution of inputs that it fails to provide a correct answer is at most the accuracy parameter. So if you are familiar with approximation algorithms, this is a bit like a PTAS, uh, except that the approximation here, instead of being, uh, so how close to the optimum you are, it's uh, how often you're able to produce a correct answer. Uh, so the interesting thing is that uh, this is a characterization. Like uh, if you have an algorithm that has this kind of behavior that you give it an input of your problem, you give it an accuracy parameter, runs in time polynomial in the size of the input and the inverse of the accuracy parameter and except with probability at most the accuracy parameter will get you the correct answer. If you have this sort of uh, average case algorithm scheme, you can transform it into an algorithm that is efficient according to Levin. Yeah. So uh, suppose we have uh, some algorithm A prime uh, such that given an input and an epsilon, it runs in polynomial time. In n over epsilon, uh, either either outputs the correct answer, or uh, it outputs uh, some kind of uh, fail uh, output, and the probability of uh, failing is at most epsilon. So then we can uh, develop um, an algorithm A that is efficient according to Levin. Okay. So what, yeah. If you, if you look at the sort of algorithms in the, in the book, like the, you know, the average case algorithms we know and love, like spectral algorithms on random graphs or uh, MCMC sampling for sparse random three set formulas or something, like are, are they all efficient by this definition? Like, is it capturing the kind of things we intuitively write as efficient average case algorithms? Or are there exceptions that we think of as, that we still want to say are efficient? You know, concrete algorithms for concrete problems that we like. Well, the thing is that often we don't uh, uh, analyze the tail of the distribution. Okay, so we say, well, um, you know, except with polynomially small probability, we kind of get the right answer. Uh, now, if uh, if you can say, you know, I have running time that is polynomial except with exponentially small probability, then for sure you are um, uh, satisfying this definition. If your running time is polynomial, kind of except with polynomially small probability, then you would really have to look a bit more into exactly what is the, the trade-off, like how long would it take to get a smaller error of probability? Also, there is another issue that, actually there are multiple issues. Um, so one is that, although in a minute I will give a different definition, but this definition talks about algorithms that never make a mistake or kind of the worst thing they can do is to give up at a certain point. But for many of the algorithms that you uh, studied, that's not necessarily 
uh, what's happening. Like maybe the algorithm always gives some kind of answer. Sometimes the answer is totally off, but it's not able to tell when the answer is uh, good and um, uh, when it isn't. So, for instance, right, like you know, we often write algorithms for reputation problems, and those those we require to be always right. So that at least that part of the definition fits, right? There... Well, it's not that they're always right. Um... Well, they either produce some some certificate, or if they fail to find that certificate, they can check. You know, they can say yeah, yes, exactly. So um, the, uh, the the refutation algorithms. If you think of uh, failing to find the refutation as kind of failing in this sense, then they satisfy, they would satisfy this definition, provided that you would be able to analyze the tail of the distribution. So to say, well, if I go to kind of higher and higher degree of sum of squares or uh, uh, whatever approach I'm using, how much am I? decreasing the probability of uh, failing. And do I ever get to the point where uh, I am kind of never failing, like I'm refuting all the unsatisfiable formulas. And uh, uh, sort of, is the probability of failing always polynomial in the, in the running time? I'd say if you do sum of square carelessly, you, you maybe get something like running time and choose K, sorry, you get running time and to the K, but the probability is more like one over N choose K. And kind of eventually you have this N to the N versus two to the N, which are not polynomial in uh, one another. So, so what would be wrong with a definition that more closely follows the kind of algorithmic guarantees we're used to writing, where we just say, uh, you know, with probability at least one minus uh, a, a, a tiny polynomial, the algorithm does well, and that's the end of the story. That um, it's trickier to get reductions that preserve this notion of uh, tractability. Uh, because if you, so as we'll see later to kind of get any hope of making reductions work, the probability of failing should be uh, negligible in the sense of the word as in um, cryptography that uh, somehow you can bound it by any polynomial that you want. So okay. here, we could write, we could write, I mean, very often in our algorithms, sorry, I was spending too much attention, but we can, we can often write our algorithms papers like that, but it doesn't have to be exponentially small, right? If you want reductions where you compose polynomial time algorithms polynomially many times, like failure probability uh, one over n to the log n would be okay, yes, right? Exactly. But so it's not um, tolerated by this definition. Re this really requires exponentially small failure probability. Yes. So, um, in fact, maybe uh, I, I thought about doing uh, things a different way to sort of first uh, describe what the reductions look like and then work backwards what reasonable definition of uh, tractability uh, those reductions preserve. Because, then you start to, because that's really the way things happen that uh, I, I'm assuming. That's so Levin had the reduction in mind and then he came up with the definition that kind of these reductions would uh, work well with. So if our definition of tract tractability is the algorithm runs in fixed polynomial time, and that's actually the definition most often used in uh, cryptography. The, the, the algorithm runs in fixed polynomial running time. The probability of failure is negligible, meaning it goes to zero faster than the inverse of any polynomial. Then this definition is fine. Like it's preserved by the reductions and um, it's robust in um, in many ways, and uh, it definitely um, is a closer match to um, what we usually call uh, tractability when we analyze algorithms. Okay. Uh, 
I like that definition more. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so, um, so regarding this definition, I uh, so I wanted to argue this uh, characterization. So, so remember where we uh, left off, we said that if something had this root over running time being linear in expectation, then you can kind of change it into an algorithm that has fixed polynomial time and uh, inverse polynomial probability of failure. And uh, the converse holds in the sense that if you have an algorithm that has fixed polynomial running time, inverse polynomial probability of failure, you can trade off the probability of failure with your uh, running time. And then you can get an algorithm that is always right and that has you know, Levin type um, efficiency. And the way you would uh, uh, do that is to uh, just, uh, you run, so given an input X, uh, you run it with some fixed value of uh, epsilon. If it fails, you try a smaller epsilon. Uh, if it fails, you try an even smaller epsilon and so on. You let them decrease expansion. Uh, so, so this is, uh, this is an algorithm that is always right and uh, has variable uh, running time. Uh, what is the let's say two? Well, um. Well, when you uh, look at the running time of uh, this algorithm, well, um, it always runs a prime once. And so it has whatever is the running time of uh, uh, a prime. It, with probability at most one quarter, it runs it again. With probability at most one eight, it runs it again and so on. So uh, I guess you have to, uh, okay, so the first time it was n over epsilon to the c. So it's uh, two n to the c to the one over two c. So then we probably at most uh, a half it fails. And now we run it with, uh, now n over epsilon is 4n. Okay, maybe I need the uh, three here. We probably one quarter, it fails twice. And then we have to run it with the uh, parameter eight. So basically in this calculation, we get uh, N times the summation of This is it's like one over Yeah. 
so you get some kind of uh, I think with one third works you get some kind of geometric series that uh, has an exponent smaller than uh, uh, one I guess what it's uh, two to the k plus one to the one third divided by two to the k it goes down exponentially in k uh, and so this is order of uh, n to the one over to the c and that's uh, smaller than uh, order one. But apart from the calculation, which I think it's right with 99% probability, but the, the, the point of the algorithm is just that if you have these uh, kind of average case approximation scheme where you can get smaller, smaller failure probability with higher and higher running time, you can convert it into an algorithm that is always right just by trying again and, and again with uh, smaller and smaller uh, epsilon parameters. And uh, that will satisfy Levin's definition. Uh, okay. Now that we have um, this characterization, uh, yeah? yeah. Was there a question? The garbage truck. Yeah, can I ask that some kind of a question? So the first thing you point you want is expectation, or is this there's no expectation? Oh, sorry. Uh, hello. Yeah, I guess I'm trying to ask in the first inequality uh, why there's expectation or just a typo. Uh, so in the first inequality, uh, like the right hand side. Sorry, I meant. Ah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. And also, I want to clarify, are you assuming that you try these algorithms multiple times, the failing are independent, so that's why you get a 1 over 4 for the second failure? No, it's not that they're independent. Okay. Um, so I uh, guess I'm first using convexity to get the exponent uh, uh, out of the sum, uh, linearity of expectation to uh, divide the tries. But the, uh, the point is that the uh, probability on a random x that I say I go to the third try, it's one quarter because I need to have uh, this, this. This has to be one of the axes for which the algorithm fail with parameter one quarter. At the most, one quarter of them fail. It also has to be one of those that fail with when the parameter is a half. And uh, those events need not to be contained in one another, uh, but you can still upper bound the probability that it fails the first two cases by uh, one quarter. Yeah, so. When, when I do these multiple tries, I always decrease the second parameter. So an input x for which I have failed the first two times, in particular failed the previous time, and the probability mass of the axis that fail here is at most one quarter by the way I define the behavior of this algorithm. Okay. Um uh, trying to uh, work out in my head, the, the weaker guarantees that you said don't satisfy this definition when you had uh, like a, a one over n to the log n probability of having exponential uh, two to the running time or one over, you know, how would they look like in this view would that translate into a, a weak super polynomial dependence on epsilon or how like? No, in, in that case, you would even have exponential dependency on um, epsilon at some point. Uh, because if, uh, it, it, say that the way your uh, um, distribution of running times look like is that with probability one over n to the log n, your running time is exponential. Then if you want epsilon to be less than one over n to the log n, you need to allow, in that case, the running time to be exponential. 
but then to do then as a function of uh, n to the log n is also essentially exponential. Okay, something like uh, two to the, well, but it's, um, But that's also a very unnatural behavior. Like somehow you, it's hard to imagine a problem where, I mean, this is more about the analysis of the algorithm than the reality of the algorithm. That there would be a one or just a slightly super polynomially small fraction of inputs, like a one over n to the log n fraction of inputs on which you are unable to do anything and you just uh, have exponential running time. You would expect more like a, a situation where if you allow your algorithm to run more, like you and you go to higher degree, some square, or you let your MCNC use more time to mix or uh, so whatever is the approach that you are employing, that then as you allow more resources into your algorithm, the fraction of inputs on which the algorithm is unable to provide the correct answer will correspondingly shrink. And there will not be something like, uh, uh, you have to reach exponential time to get a probability of failure less than one over um, n to the log n. Whether really this tail has power law as required by this definition, it's very strict and uh, you sort of, um, uh, I think even Levin will accept that uh, people will prefer other uh, uh, definitions, but it's not as, um, I would expect that if we actually put the extra work on uh, analyzing how we could trade off failure probability with running time of the algorithm, we would see um, inverse polynomial tails or even steeper tails that, you know, maybe just increase the running time to a larger polynomial and you already have an exponentially small probability of failure, something like that. Audience looks happy, so. Okay. <laughs> so, um, actually, I was concerned I had too little material for today, but I see that I am at page uh, two of 10 of <laughs> what I wanted to do today, uh, which is great uh, because uh, kind of other things later can be sort of uh, skipped or done more quickly. Uh, but, so, uh, but, but so now that we have these equivalents, it's possible to talk about algorithms that make mistakes. Uh, somehow when, you, when we were just kind of looking at the expected running time of the algorithm or roots of the running time of the algorithm, there wasn't really a, a place to talk about mistakes. Um, so it, it was sort of a, a parameter not present in the equation. But when we think of algorithms as having these sort of two inputs, one that says, what is the input and the other that says, so how picky you are about the quality of uh, the solutions. Then it becomes very natural to incorporate uh, mistakes. Like you could uh, sort of see, uh, this is a definition due to Impagliazzo. Uh, he called it a heuristic scheme. Uh, to have an algorithm that has again two inputs. And uh, the output uh, may or may not be the correct answer for X. The running time is polynomial in uh, the length of X uh, over epsilon. And the probability 
that the output is not correct is less than epsilon. So the difference from before is that before the algorithm knew when it didn't know the answer. It was a known unknown. Um, here, you just allow the algorithm to answer something that is completely wrong. And uh, mm, for, for example, if you look at uh, a random sat above the threshold, where the goal is to do refutations, the previous definition is what you want. So you want an algorithm that when it tells you something, you can trust it. But when it says the formula is unsatisfiable, it actually has found the refutation. Uh, and then there will be inputs on which it's not able to do it, but uh, maybe you can make the fraction of those inputs smaller and smaller as you allow more and more running time. If you have a heuristic scheme for a three sat above the threshold, basically you could just say the formula is unsatisfiable always. And uh, except when epsilon is like exponentially small, then you take exponential time and use just brute force uh, three sat. So <coughs> kind of three sat about threshold is a kind of trivial heuristic scheme, but what you're really looking for in that case, it's a algorithm that satisfies more like Levin's definition, or at least something that is always right and sometimes knows that it doesn't know. For other problems like uh, kind of stochastic block model type problems, planted click, um, three sat below the threshold, this definition is fine. Like you don't always have to uh, well, I guess three sat below the threshold in a way also is like levels because when you find a satisfying assignment, you know that you have found the right solution. But for uh, sort of other optimization problems, it's okay that you find a solution that you cannot certify that it's good, but just the probabilistic analysis says that uh, it uh, usually is. And uh, so th those two notions appear to be um, not incomparable, but like uh, uh, distinct that uh, the previous notion is strictly more powerful. And that there seems to be natural problems like uh, random trees at above the threshold for which the second definition is almost trivial to achieve. The first definition is what we uh, believe to be hard. Okay, so I guess we have already run into the time of the uh, first break. What I want to tell you after the break will be how we can define a notion of reductions that will preserve these definitions of tractability and also Sam's definition and uh, kind of other um, uh, reasonable ones. And then we'll see if there is enough time, otherwise we'll continue tomorrow, how to get a complete problem, like how, how to reduce every problem in NP under a large class of distributions to a particular problem under the uniform distribution and what data compression, how data compression is used in uh, these reductions. Okay, so I, um, I think we can take the break now. So I guess we had a bunch of questions throughout, so maybe we'll just go to break now and we'll see you in 20 minutes uh, at uh, 10 to 11. Thanks, Luca. Okay, it, the schedule said 15 minutes. Yeah, we just, we've been we've been noticing that people prefer a 20 minute break. So, <laughs> all right, so see you then. Okay, of course. <laughs> okay.